Well, hello and uh, welcome. Uh, today we'll present a uh, discussion of uh, some of the key findings and factors involved in uh, diagnosis and management of uh, diseases in the, in the uh, esophagus. I'm coming to you from the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences campus. Uh, nearby is the uh, National Cowboy Museum from which this uh, image uh, derives. Um, and it reminds us that we need to have a meeting of the mind sometimes uh, as we uh, deal with this of the pathologist and the endoscopist. Uh, so uh, our objectives today, of course, is to review a little bit of the normal uh, histology to enable us to better interpret the findings, uh, remind ourselves of the types of procedures and therefore the specimens that uh, may, we may encounter in surgical pathology, and review the diagnostic criteria for various non-neoplastic and neoplastic diseases. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the uh, current and emerging uh, treatment options uh, that are uh, on the horizon as well. So as we enter the esophagus, we'll touch on the normal anatomy, types of specimens, and so forth. Uh, let's begin. So normal esophageal mucosa, as we all know, is a squamous uh, type mucosa. Uh, there is a, a submucosa and a muscularis mucosa. Um, uh, that uh, uh, define a lamina propria superior to that and uh, deep to that, as we see here. Uh, there may be occasional uh, little reedy papillae extending up into the squamous epithelium to provide nutrients. Um, and uh, the thickness of the uh, muscularis mucosa can be uh, variable. In addition, uh, there may be uh, small uh, ducts, uh, usually lined by squamous mucosa, uh, leading to submucosal glands. Um, and these uh, glands typically, as seen here, are located uh, between the muscularis mucosa and the muscularis propria, uh, usually also seen in association with larger vessels and lymphatics. And that, of course, is uh, one key feature in staging. Uh, most of these glands are a mixture of serous and mucinous uh, type glands, although you see there is a predominant of uh, mucinous uh, type epithelium uh, in most of these uh, as evidenced here um, on this uh, additional histologic uh, image. There are various uh, variants that uh, can be encountered. Uh, one such variant, of course, is that uh, uh, gastric cardia and submucosal type glands can sometimes be encountered uh, beneath uh, the uh, squamous mucosa, uh, possibly representing uh, extension of squamous mucosa into the proximal stomach. Uh, we know certainly that the opposite also happens as well. Um, and sometimes these ducts are lined by more columnar rather than squamous uh, mucosa. Another variant of, to be aware of is the uh, so-called inlet patch. Uh, this is a small uh, zone of uh, gastric type mucosa that can be encountered in the upper third of the esophagus uh, and uh, may uh, provide uh, a uh, concern for Barrett's or may be of concern for malignancy to the uh, inexperienced observer. Uh, this is not a heterotopia per se, but is a, a true normal variant. So uh, the specimens that we can receive range from just very small strips of surface mucosa, as you see here, to somewhat larger bites uh, with uh, some mucosa and submucosa, uh, to uh, larger endoscopic uh, mucosal resections, as seen here, that give you a uh, very expanded portion, um, and it may include some submucosal tissue as well. Uh, the procedure through which this is performed it's called uh, endoscopic mucosal resection. And key to that uh, procedure is uh, some ability to elevate the mucosa uh, by means of uh, the use of a lifting agent, as you see here, um, that uh, provides some degree of edema and separation uh, between the mucosa and submucosa of concern uh, and the underlying muscularis uh, propria. Uh, pre preventing thus uh, the uh, risk of uh, 
uh, esophageal uh, leak uh, and potentially infection uh, to more uh, uh, serious underlying structures like the mediastinum and so forth. Um, various agents have been used for this uh, lifting procedure, um, and uh, some of them uh, have created new pathologies in and of themselves, uh, but we won't go into that too much today. Um, another uh, type of specimen, of course, that we can receive is uh, some combination of uh, uh, resection uh, that includes the uh, uh, esophagus and various proportions, uh, and usually or uh, most often a portion of the uh, uh, proximal stomach as well. Um, so whether it's performed using the Ivor Lewis technique or other techniques, uh, these uh, resection specimens uh, need to be handled uh, carefully to appropriately stage and uh, identify uh, a response to treatment and uh, prognosis for the patient. So uh, focusing on non-neoplastic diseases, certainly the most common uh, we'll deal with, reflux and, and various infections diseases, and then some of the uh, less common uh, but also significant diseases. So uh, in, it's important to understand the kind of response to injury that the uh, squamous mucosa of the esophagus can undergo. Uh, one of the first of these is what's called spongiosis or uh, interstitial edema. Uh, you see the uh, separation of the cells one from another with the intervening residual spinous layer of the uh, keratinocytes being somewhat highlighted uh, as these, each of these cells and their membranes are uh, uh, outlined. Additionally, you can see uh, expansion of the basal zone uh, and elongation of these uh, reedy papillae uh, so that they uh, begin to occupy two thirds to three quarters of the uh, uh, total uh, epithelial thickness. Um, that uh, is a characteristic response to surface uh, injury. And then the uh, infiltration of inflammatory cells uh, goes along with this. And essentially there are three principal types of inflammatory cells that we see most often. Uh, here we see pretty much predominantly lymphocytes. Uh, they can have these sort of dark squiggly uh, uh, nuclei uh, sometimes with uh, accentuated cleared cytoplasm. Uh, we can also see uh, eosinophils uh, and uh, neutrophils, uh, more particularly near the surface. Uh, with progressive injury, uh, you get to see more significant uh, changes. So here's a nice uh, sequence, uh, fairly normal, uh, but the beginnings of some vascular congestion and maybe some edema around these, around these reedy papillae. Uh, that leads to the uh, sort of uh, accumulation of serum in the interstitium uh, that may uh, give you this appearance of little serum lakes uh, within the squamous epithelium. Uh, a further uh, extension of this uh, injury pattern can lead to the accumulation of neutrophils um, usually near the surface more than at the base of the uh, epithelium, um, and ultimately to erosion with fibrin deposition, reactive granulation tissue, and so forth. Uh, and in varying degrees, this granulation tissue can be uh, very active and sometimes atypical. Uh, for example, as you see here, uh, ulceration has led to a very florid uh, granulation tissue vascular response that uh, for all the world uh, tends to mimic a uh, dehesive uh, type carcinoma uh, with abundant atypia, uh, some prominent nucleoli, amphiphilia of the cytoplasm, variable variability of uh, size and shape of these nuclei. Uh, so these can look very atypical and when it's seen in conjunction with some regenerative squamous atypia, one can be concerned about an invasive, uh, poorly differentiated carcinoma sarcomatoid carcinoma and things of that sort. Looking at this a little bit more uh, high magnification, you can even see a greater degree of this pleomorphism um, and uh, the associated uh, inflammatory atypia of the squamous epithelium. This is a pitfall uh, and so you have to be very cautious uh, in determining whether or not this is cancer. Uh, if you need to do immunohistochemical stains for cytokeratins, for vascular markers, uh, to uh, feel confident in your decision, we certainly uh, 
would endorse that. Uh, uh, <clears throat> so reflux esophagitis uh, typically has uh, two uh, types of inflammatory cells that are seen. Uh, most commonly is uh, lymphocytes, uh, but if there's uh, active injury going on, uh, they will be associated with uh, eosinophils. Uh, as you can see here, a few scattered eosinophils within the squamous mucosa. And uh, accompanying this is an, an epithelial hyperplasia with uh, proliferation of the basal zone and thus the resulting uh, elongation of the reedy papillae. Um, so these findings characterize uh, reflux esophagitis. Uh, it can lead to ulceration, but typically uh, this is a sort of chronic injury, day-to-day -to -day -to -day injury that uh, accumulates over time. Uh, and uh, this sort of uh, uh, reaches a new steady state, if you will, uh, where the inflammation and the hyperplasia sort of uh, counterbalance the acidic injury. Uh, something that can mimic that, uh, but uh, can it really occur at any level because uh, uh, the um, reflux esophagitis tends to be most frequently encountered distally. Uh, but a pill ulcer is, uh, by contrast, uh, seen more commonly in the mid-esophagus. And why is that? Well, typically because that's where there's a slight indentation from the aortic arch uh, in the uh, contour of the uh, esophagus and pills can be uh, become lodged there. Uh, but really it can occur at any level. Uh, this can lead to a deep ulceration, some splaying of the muscularis. Uh, but of course it's helpful to know uh, the history and the type of medication that's involved. Uh, iron medications are uh, typical, NSAIDs of course. Another medication that has a fairly specific uh, finding is that of the K-exalate sorbitol uh, crystals. Uh, and these can occur anywhere in the GI tract, uh, but these uh, result in a sort of ischemic type ulcer uh, with the deposition of their characteristic uh, crystals. Uh, and uh, we've produced another video uh, going into these uh, uh, morphology of these uh, more uh, closely elsewhere. Uh, an important differential with uh, reflux esophagitis is a more allergic chronic esophagitis uh, called eosinophilic esophagitis. Uh, this is associated with pain, dysphagia, the sensation of food sticking, uh, and may have sort of a ring-like appearance uh, endoscopically. Um, and it is involving both the lower and mid esophagus or upper esophagus. Uh, it's characterized by a fairly dramatic increase in eosinophils uh, along with the associated edema and some degree of basilar hyperplasia. Uh, so when you start to see 30, 40, 50 uh, eosinophils in one high power field, uh, that's the time when you better be thinking about eosinophilic esophagitis because uh, that's uh, typically more than one that gets with uh, um, reactive uh, esophagitis. Uh, here's a higher magnification view, and you can see uh, literally uh, hundreds of eosinophils uh, in this uh, uh, short view here. And higher magnification. Oh, they're, they're pretty, pretty cells, but uh, the, the disease is painful. Um, in children, it's most likely a food allergen. In adults, uh, it can be associated with uh, medications or other uh, allergens uh, as well. Um, there can be some variability, um, and uh, so uh, if you don't see the florid uh, 50 to 100, but you're seeing, you know, 15 to 30, 40, um, you can still make that diagnosis, particularly if it's the proximal and mid esophagus that's uh, involved. Another entity that uh, enters into the differential is lymphocytic esophagitis, where our uh, uh, infiltrate is exclusively lymphocytes, but we also may get some reactivity. Um, in children, there's a fairly strong association with Crohn's disease, but in adults, when we see this, uh, it uh, uh, does not have a specific uh, recognized association. It may be a partially treated reflux esophagitis, uh, but in many respects, it just re reflects a sort of contact dermatitis. Uh, 
such as we'd see in the skin uh, with various contact allergens. Uh, here you can see a higher magnification view showing you these squiggly nuclei here. And sometimes they look a little bit multilobated. Don't let that confuse you with the uh, 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 neutrophils, uh, which will have more rounded rather than the squiggly type of appearance. Uh, another entity occasionally encountered, usually in the elderly, is uh, so-called sloughing esophagitis. And here you see the endoscopic appearance with sort of a geographic area of superficial necrosis and just uh, sort of easily sloughing off or uh, uh, sliding away from the underlying uh, mucosa. Uh, this is usually associated with other forms of debilitating illness and uh, potentially with medications. Um, if you happen to see a biopsy of this, uh, it has this characteristic two-tone appearance with a superficial, uh, seemingly perikeratotic uh, slough uh, that easily separates from the underlying more viable uh, squamous mucosa. Uh, other disorders of the keratinocytes can also involve the esophagus. Uh, pemphigus is uh, one of these that is not restricted to the skin. Um, and you can see here this uh, suprabasilar um, uh, blister essentially with uh, acanthalysis of the squamous uh, cells. Uh, so this uh, consideration can be raised, uh, uh, particularly if there's a, uh, an associated history um, uh, of cutaneous disease or oral disease that would support that. Uh, infectious uh, diseases also affect uh, the esophagus. Uh, one of the most common, of course, is uh, candida esophagitis. Uh, which, uh, as you see here, is uh, associated with these uh, uh, fungal pseudohyphae. Uh, and these have a very characteristic sort of deep penetrating uh, pattern in their more florid sense, almost like they're piercing uh, the uh, keratinocytes uh, with the yeast forms then on the surface. But you can see them here um, in the, the stratified layers, uh, usually perpendicular uh, to the mucosal surface. A few other infectious uh, etiologies to be aware of is uh, human papillomavirus occasionally, especially in patients who have uh, uh, laryngeal papillomatosis, uh, and then various filamentous bacteria, actinomyces, uh, and so forth. Moving on to some of the squamous proliferations, uh, sort of maybe HP would be related or otherwise, uh, we can see benign squamous papillomas uh, in the esophagus, as well as uh, what's been termed the clear cell acanthoma with pronounced uh, glycogenation of the nuclei clearing uh, and a degree of hyperplasia that uh, uh, seems incongruous. As a localized lesion, uh, this should be uh, uh, carefully correlated with what the endoscopist saw because you wouldn't want to confuse a tangential biopsy that just seemed to have a lot of glycogen uh, and incorrectly uh, uh, call it an acanthoma. Uh, that would certainly generate a phone call uh, but here you can see a little higher magnification how these cells have uh, more abundant clear cytoplasm. Uh, the distinction or the, the, the uh, contrast between the adjacent more normal epithelium and the acanthoma uh, usually will be sharp, uh, but um, in not all cases will you get that uh, boundary zone uh, to uh, see that. Squamous papillomas, as you see here, uh, no HPV effect uh, to be noted, and uh, therefore you would not ascribe that to HPV-related disease. Now, squamous uh, dysplasia, we're beginning to move into the squamous proliferations that are more serious. Um, we use a two-tier system, uh, grading low-grade squamous dysplasia involving the basal layers or lower third. Uh, and something that's more full thickness, uh, uh, mid-level and above uh, as high grade. Um, here we can see some more examples of this, uh, high grade dysplasia here, uh, a more low grade type dysplasia here, but with some significant atypia. And then here, obviously full thickness, uh, high grade uh, dysplasia. Now, uh, some observers have called this uh, one here uh, high-grade dysplasia, even though it does not reach the surface, uh, based on the degree of cytologic atypia uh, that is present here, um, uh, mimicking uh, frank squamous carcinoma. Um, 
And you shouldn't uh, be confused by the initials here, uh, esophageal intraepithelial neoplasia uh, versus endometrial intraepithelial neoplasia. They have the same initials. Uh, so you may want to spell that out to, be, uh, to avoid confusion. Well, that brings us to the invasive squamous lesions. Uh, we'll talk uh, briefly about the various risk factors, uh, differentiation issues, staging and treatment uh, with these. So uh, differentiation can be quite variable. Uh, we can have nice uh, keratinization, squamous pearls, uh, no keratinization, areas of necrosis, areas of more spindle-shaped uh, differentiation. Uh, so it can be a uh, really a mixed bag as it is in other locations as well. Uh, the risk factors associated with squamous cell carcinoma obviously is a long list. Um, these are mostly well known. Uh, certainly anyone with squamous cell carcinoma in situ or dysplasia is uh, at higher risk. Uh, tobacco and alcohol have historically been uh, heavily associated uh, with this uh, in populations where uh, prevalent use of both uh, uh, toxins is uh, habitual. Uh, become uh, areas where we see this uh, in, in its greatest incidence. Um, but also other things, lack of fruits and vegetables, deficiencies in various vitamins uh, and minerals, including things like zinc and molybdenum uh, can also be factors. Uh, in various other populations, use of uh, things like betel nuts or fungal contamination of uh, food products, really hot foods and beverages, nitrates, nitrosamines, such as uh, found in uh, uh, various uh, well waters that are contaminated or fungal contaminate, uh, as well as polycyclic aromatics uh, in urban environments. Um, there are various uh, less frequently encountered things like achalasia, celiac disease, uh, various toxins, uh, strictures related to uh, deficiencies and so forth. Uh, these can all uh, seemingly elevate the risk, potentially due to either uh, dysmotility and prolonged exposure, uh, various other sorts of things. Uh, some association with HPV has been seen in some high-risk areas uh, and probably dependent on uh, certain other practices as well. So the treatment uh, for squamous cell carcinoma essentially uh, falls into two paths. One, if it's uh, local or regional, local, excuse me, local regional disease, and those with advanced disease. If it's locally, uh, local regional disease, that's potentially curable. Um, and particularly uh, those very localized lesions that may be amenable to endoscopic resection. Um, in other patients with uh, local regional disease, uh, adjuvant treatments like radiation therapy or radiation and chemo uh, have been uh, used uh, to provide a, uh, a subsequent resection uh, that is uh, either cancer-free or uh, has minimal residual disease. Um, and of course, obviously, those same agents can be used in uh, palliation as well. In terms of molecular and genetic factors, uh, most uh, uh, squamous cancers are aneuploid and have high levels of uh, epidermal growth factor receptors. There are a variety of mutations that are consistently uh, demonstrated, such as those with P53 and P16, cyclin D1, CMYK, EGFR, and so forth. Um, whereas uh, KRAS mutation is so common elsewhere, uh, it's surprisingly rare in esophageal squamous carcinomas. Uh, similarly, uh, APC mutations, which we uh, find to be such a problem in the lower tract, uh, are virtually unknown in the esophagus. Now, one special variant of uh, squamous cell carcinoma deserves mention, and that is the basaloid squamous carcinoma. Uh, as you re might expect, it has a, a typical uh, peripheral basal palisade uh, of nuclei sort of uh, perpendicularly oriented to the stroma uh, and surrounding a more disoriented areas. There may be some degree of mixoid change in the stroma. Uh, and the reason this is important is because uh, the prognosis uh, and clinical features are uh, different in these patients. Uh, these tend to be older men in the mid to distal esophagus, and they are often widespread on presentation. And stage for stage, the prognosis is, uh, is worse. Uh, 
there is no uh, HPV association, um, and uh, they tend to have a similar molecular genetic feature, at least uh, to our knowledge to this point. Uh, additional work may be warranted in that area. Uh, another variant uh, that is worth noting for perhaps the opposite reason is verrucous carcinoma. Uh, these tend to be minimally invasive, but exophytic, uh, but they tend to be so well differentiated that they're difficult to diagnose, uh, at least under the microscope in isolation. Uh, but if you correlate well with the endoscopic and clinical uh, radiologic findings, uh, this uh, lesion should be uh, amenable to diagnosis. It does take a degree of courage and bravery to call something that looks relatively bland a carcinoma, uh, but realize that you're not gonna see infiltrative invasion with Baruchus carcinoma, and you have to make that diagnosis based on uh, the presence of perikeratosis, a uh, mild degree of atypia, and a pushing lower border. Uh, another variant to be aware of is sarcomatoid carcinoma, uh, which has this biphasic appearance. These tend to be rather bulky, but they are largely exophytic. And because of that, they actually have a better prognosis uh, than uh, typical uh, squamous cell carcinomas. Uh, for example, uh, they have about a 50% survival rate. They present at lower stage, um, and only uh, about a third have nodal metastases. So uh, if you can detect them early, uh, resect them locally, uh, these patients can have a, a fairly uh, good prognosis and outcome. Uh, markers may be helpful. Uh, they may be both positive for uh, vimentin and uh, keratin staining, uh, but uh, certainly seeing a biphasic pattern or seeing that uh, exophytic pattern of growth, one should first think of sarcomatoid carcinoma. Small cell carcinomas also occur in the esophagus. Uh, they are not very common, but as far as small cell carcinomas outside the lung go, uh, they are the more common uh, site. Uh, they account for about 1% of esophageal cancers, and these again are usually elder patients with a male predominance. Uh, heavy cigarette smoking is usually present as part of the history, and these uh, have a rather dismal uh, outcome. Now of note, the immunohistochemistry is uh, frequently positive for TTF1, um, and so uh, differentiation from pulmonary metastases versus uh, primary uh, uh, cannot be done strictly on the basis of immunohistochemistry, as that's true with small cell carcinomas in several other areas. Now, there are a few other variants uh, to be aware of, uh, such as uh, uh, glass or clear cell uh, squamous cell carcinomas. Uh, there are other uh, carcinomas, uh, mucoepidermoid and uh, uh, some other uh, glandular-derived uh, tumors as well to be uh, concerned with in these locations, but these are uh, uh, relatively uncommon as uh, squamous variants. Um, so let's go on and talk about the at least the, the biggest issue in uh, the esophagus is uh, Barrett's esophagus and uh, the uh, relationship of that to dysplasia and subsequent adenocarcinoma. So first off, what is Barrett's esophagus? Well, uh, unfortunately, it's defined a little bit differently uh, depending on which side of the pond you're on, depending on which side of the Atlantic Ocean and which uh, school of uh, gastroenterologists you tend to uh, uh, follow. Uh, on the American side of things, um, uh, they have uh, issued a couple of uh, uh, statements on this uh, disease from 2008. Uh, any change in the distal esophagus that can be recognized as columnar type mucosa uh, and is confirmed by biopsy to have intestinal metaplasia. So uh, distal esophagus and metaplasia. So that requires the coordination of both where you are and what you see. So the endoscopist has to know where they are and the pathologist has to tell you what you're seeing. Um, the uh, Definition in 2011 was uh, the extent of a metaplastic columnar epithelium that predisposes to cancer development. Well, so that's a little bit more ambiguous. Um, and the British Society of Gastroenterology 
takes a more broad uh, liberal view requiring that it only be endoscopically apparent greater than a sonometer above the GE junction and confirmed to have columnar epithelium. Uh, so these are you know, slightly variable uh, definitions, but we get the, the general idea that it's columnar mucosa above the gastroesophageal junction. Um, and uh, we can then go from there to describe what we see. So uh, the most frequent change, of course, is non-intestinal uh, metaplastic columnar epithelium, a little bit right here. But uh, the, the concern, at least uh, where I practice, uh, is the presence or absence of intestinal metaplasia. So that's the first question. If we have columnar mucosa, do we have intestinal type metaplasia? And that's characterized by the presence of goblet cells which contain an intestinal type or bluish mucin. You can see uh, pseudo goblet cells in, in many circumstances which have a sort of goblet type configuration uh, but do not have this bluish tinge to the mucin. Uh, they will have a pink or pale uh, mucin and that does not uh, qualify as intestinal metaplasia. We won't go into the uh, more fine tuned distinctions of uh, columnar blues and so forth. So here's uh, uh, maybe an example. Here's some cells up here that have sort of a goblet like appearance, but they don't really have blue mucin. Whereas over here, you can see there's a little bit more bluish tinge. It's just very, very subtle, but your H&E uh, stain should help you to distinguish those. Here again, we see very little or nothing on the surface, but down here, we can see there's a few cells in these deeper glands that are clearly uh, goblet cells with intestinal type mucin. Uh, so this is just to give you a range of the kinds of things. And this change can be very focal. So multiple levels and careful search are certainly warranted uh, in evaluation of the esophagus. Now with a Barrett's esophagus, we can also see some additional stromal changes. Uh, one of these is a so-called duplication of the muscularis mucosa. With this reduplication, it can appear as though we have a mucosa, lamina propria, muscularis mucosa, submucosa, and then muscularis propria. But in fact, uh, were we to see the full thickness, you can see the submucosal sized vessels are down here. And so being aware of this change is very, very important uh, as we deal with the uh, dysplasias and invasive carcinomas that arise in this and properly staging. Another feature that can be found is that this uh, muscularis mucosa can get pulled up into uh, the uh, uh, mucosa, creating a sort of pseudo-invasive uh, pattern. Um, and that uh, pitfall, again, needs to be avoided uh, when, when you start to see dysplasia uh, being present. So other things that we can see in this setting are PANF cells. Um, as you see here, the uh, granular eosinophilic cytoplasm, most uh, typical in the uh, basal cell areas. Uh, we can also see other endocrine cells, uh, endocrine cell hyperplasia as seen here. Um, and that could be particularly true if there are other uh, endocrine driving uh, disorders like uh, uh, Zollinger-Ellison or things like that that are going on as well. Now here's uh, an example of uh, the mucin that can be demonstrated. Uh, the, the mucin that we're concerned with is this darker blue mucin. Uh, this is the intestinal type mucin. This, this is stained with an alcyon blue uh, stain. Um, but there, as you notice, there's other blue, paler blue mucin here as well. Uh, and these cells are sometimes referred to as columnar blues. Um, they may be a marker of intestinal uh, type epithelium, uh, but they're not, they're not uh, used in the same sense of being diagnostic of uh, uh, predysplastic intestinal type metaplasia. So while you may see that, uh, it's important to differentiate these uh, sort of columnar blues from the uh, true goblet cell uh, blue mucins. Okay, so the big elephant then is dysplasia. So what are the things uh, that we need to be concerned about? Well, uh, we can think of this as being clearly neoplastic cytologic changes, 
Uh, we can look in terms of what is happening on the cellular, but also look at the architectural changes uh, to, to correctly classify and grade the dysplasia. Uh, there are certain critical distinctions that are important, and, and those are these. Uh, is there dysplasia or not? Uh, if there's not, the patient is going to stay in a routine follow-up. If there is dysplasia, their follow-up is going to change and their intervention is going to change. Once we've decided there's dysplasia, we need to absolutely differentiate whether it's high grade or low grade. Um, because again, this will determine a different course of follow-up and treatment. Unfortunately, uh, the, the concordance studies between observers uh, are really not so great in terms of low-grade dysplasia. Um, we're better at differentiating high-grade dysplasia, but this distinction between no dysplasia and low-grade dysplasia is, um, is a little bit problematic for us. And so hopefully lectures like this and more practice and digital slide reviews will help you uh, in, in doing that. Uh, you might also take a look at our companion video that uh, deals with that topic. So we use the term indefinite for dysplasia when we seem to have cytologic or architectural changes, but we also have a confounding variable such as active inflammation, most commonly, uh, or occasionally ulceration or some other uh, obscuring uh, feature, maybe size or orientation or uh, uh, fixation or other factors. So, um, in terms of reporting, uh, if you're dealing with a biopsy, uh, it's important to describe what is present. We have columnar mucosa with metaplastic uh, intestinal type epithelium or goblet cells, et cetera. Uh, we need to state whether or not we have dysplasia, whether it's there or whether it's indeterminate. And if it's present, you need to grade it. Uh, this is what every uh, follow-up biopsy for potentially Barrett's esophagus is seeking uh, the answer to. So um, the key features, as I've indicated, are uh, the following. First of all, is the surface involved? If it's not involved, you need to think twice about making the diagnosis of uh, dysplasia. Uh, then uh, what's the architectural? Is there architectural change? Is it villus or is there crowding or irregular shape and size of the glands? Is there crib reforming? If you're seeing those sorts of things, then you need to think seriously about uh, high-grade dysplasia or potentially invasive carcinoma. And lastly, do we seem to have innocuous glands dropping down deeply uh, into the uh, muscularis mucosa or deeper? And uh, those uh, glands uh, need to be carefully inspected and reviewed for potential carcinoma. In terms of the cytologic features, uh, we would expect to see loss of mucin an increase in the NC ratio with maybe some stratification, uh, some nuclear pleomorphism. As that increases, you can begin to think more towards high grade. As you see abnormal mitoses, again, you'll be thinking more towards high grade. Um, and again, my increased mitotic figures, uh, not quite as specific. And then lastly, just to make sure we don't have any confounding factors. So here's some examples of uh, low-grade dysplasia. As we can see, this uh, involves the crypts and extends out to the surface. Uh, we don't have uh, every goblet cell replaced by uh, these uh, more columnar epithelium, but it looks sort of like a villus adenoma. Here on the surface, it's involved. Uh, and here we're beginning to see some architectural changes. Uh, so this is beginning to be a little bit more serious. Uh, here again, we see loss of mucin, stratification, uh, a little bit of complexity to the architecture, uh, a little bit of uh, increase in NC ratio with the uh, loss of cytoplasm. Uh, so these are nice features that I think most people, most observers would put into the low-grade dysplasia camp. Uh, this one here, beginning to be a little bit more towards the high-grade uh, camp because of the uh, little bit of architectural crowding uh, variability of size of some of these uh, glands. But it still looks mostly like a tubular adenoma. Uh, things that begin to cross the border zone, uh, well, here's clear low-grade low dysplasia, but then here we begin to see a little bit of more pleomorphism, some rounding up of the nuclei, more crowding. Uh, that's when you begin to say, could this be 
high-grade dysplasia. Uh, here, we again, we see more crowding, a little bit more pleomorphism, a uh, little bit more uh, loss of cytoplasm uh, relative to nucleus size. Uh, I don't see any atypical mitoses there, but those, those, are, those give you an idea of sort of that border zone. Here's some more images, uh, this time looking at high-grade dysplasia. So what are the features here? Well, we don't see surface, but we certainly see uh, stratification. We see some rounding up of nuclei. We see some uh, pleomorphism of the nuclei. We see certainly increased mitotic figures, uh, and we see architectural changes. Uh, here again, we see architectural changes. We see increased mitotic figures. We see some rounding up of the nuclei uh, and crowding of the glands. Uh, here we see surface involvement. We see high NC ratios with loss of cytoplasm, especially along the surface and up here. Uh, we see architectural changes. Uh, this would begin to qualify as the high-grade dysplasia, each of these images. Now, uh, areas where we begin to come into some challenges. Uh, occasionally, you'll see situations where just the surface is involved and the deeper glands do not look particularly atypical. So like these may look like usual intestinal metaplasia, but here on the surface, Gee, we've got some rounding up, so maybe some atypical mitosis that's very localized, a little bit of uh, changes here. Uh, I, I think uh, sometimes because we know that the treatment of the high-grade dysplasia is more severe, uh, we're sometimes a little bit reluctant to pull the trigger, uh, but it's certainly uh, far better to have an endoscopic resection of something like this than to uh, discover later that you have untreatable disease. Another setting where it can be difficult is where we don't have the surface because we've got squamous mucosa overlying. And this can sometimes be because there's been prior ablation or be because of there's some fluidity of the squamo mucosal border. Uh, and so with deeper glands, uh, this uh, is more problematic uh, because we often have increased mitoses. They often look uh, hyperchromatic. Uh, here you have to look more at the individual cytology and say, are these individual cells high-grade dysplasia? Uh, is this rounding up to be a, a high-grade uh, neoplastic cell? The architecture can help a little bit sometimes, but uh, very often uh, you're going to have to rely more on the cytology in that setting. Then areas where we begin to suggest carcinoma, uh, when we see confluent small tubular glands, as we see here on the right, uh, back to back to back glands. Uh, you can't really draw where the gland stops and the, the lamina propria begins. That uh, would begin to be called intramucosal carcinoma. Similarly, if we begin to see necrotic debris, uh, that's an ominous sign uh, and not something we usually associate with just uh, high grade dysplasia. Uh, so be aware of those little subtle clues to help you uh, in di the differentiation. Well, endoscopy is one way to look at these, but uh, uh, many times the endoscopist can't really di distinguish between low-grade dysplasia, high-grade dysplasia. And so, uh, you know, screening biopsies are one thing, but uh, another tool that has been proposed is uh, so-called in vivo microscopy. Uh, and the goals there are essentially to uh, guide the acquisition of uh, your biopsies so that you have a more meaningful sample, an enriched sample, if you will, uh, and also to be able to screen the entire organ for potentially occult disease. Um, and occasionally, uh, uh, in, vit in vivo microscopy can be used to make the primary diagnosis uh, when you can't safely uh, excise the tissue. Um, and similarly, you can uh, use them for follow-up to assess efficacy. Um, there are a couple of modalities. There is optical coherence uh, tomography, uh, which is uh, akin to ultrasound. Uh, this will give you 3D images and cross-sectional images that has about 10 micron resolution uh, and about 10 microns in depth. So it's not uh, like a full thickness section, but it gives you some, uh, some architectural structure. Confocal microscopy is a little bit different. Um, it does provide architecture and cellular morphology. Um, it gives you two-dimensional images that are in a plane parallel to the tissue surface. And it has a higher uh, resolution down to one and two microns. Um, and here the contrast is really based on light scatter. Uh, 
or in some circumstances, you can use uh, injected dyes such as fluorescein uh, to provide additional uh, highlighting features and distinguish nuclei uh, and other uh, various things, depending on what uh, other, other labels may be attached to the uh, fluorescent dye. Um, so uh, currently available FDA approved uh, technologies include both OCT and confocal microscopy, uh, which has also been called confocal laser endomicroscopy or CLE. Uh, there are a variety of other uh, estimate of other uh, technologies that are being used and investigated and who knows, they may have been approved since I made this slide. Um, the material costs are not insignificant, um, but um, uh, those will undoubtedly come down. So just to give you an idea, this is uh, an example of the uh, uh, optical coherence uh, uh, technology, which shows you sort of a, uh, a, a dim dimensional uh, micrograph. And you can see, as you look here, you can begin to see uh, mucosa, submucosa, muscularis mucosa, and some of these things. And so you begin to, to get a degree of um, uh, esophageal morphology that you wouldn't uh, ordinarily see. Now, uh, if you want to look a little further and compare maybe uh, uh, closely um, what we're seeing here with uh, OCT uh, versus what a histologic uh, out of focus biopsy might look, uh, and you can see there are sort of some defects, some cystic changes to these clear spaces that suggest that the architecture is altered. Uh, and therefore, this may be an enriched site for sampling to detect uh, potentially uh, either dysplasia or maybe even uh, invasive neoplasia. Uh, so uh, these are, are nice uh, correlating uh, studies. Now, the probe-based confocal uh, microscopy, uh, as I've said, it gives you more of a uh, two-dimensional image sort of parallel to the uh, surface. Um, and here you see an example of uh, you know, glandular uh, tissues you see here. You can see the nuclei in these uh, tissue structures, the intervening lamina propria, uh, and you get sort of an idea that, okay, we've got some goblet type cells here, it looks like. Um, so maybe we could call this Barrett's esophagus. Uh, now here's one where um, the architecture is altered and our nuclear uh, uh, echoes are variable in size. Our nuclear images or dark spots here are different. Uh, so this was assigned a, a degree of uh, high-grade dysplasia. Um, now, I'm not an expert on this, and uh, I'm sure that any uh, new pathologist looking at this or even experienced pathologist looking at this would say that's not as good as my microscope. Um, and that's true. Uh, but the point is that there are things that uh, we can do with this that we may not be able to do with the microscope. And uh, over time, as you can see here, our imaging capability with this uh, kind of modality um, will improve dramatically. And, and we can begin to see uh, these type of uh, neoplastic uh, pr proliferations that really correspond fairly nicely uh, to what we uh, are used to seeing with uh, pink and blue. And in fact, uh, there are me methods by which they can colorize these images to make them look uh, for all the, all the world like uh, an H&E image. So stay tuned to that and be alert for that change uh, on the horizon. Let me talk a little bit about some of the methods of treatment, uh, just so you're aware of those. This, I'm not an interventional endoscopist, but I want you to be aware of some of the methods. So one of the ways of dealing with uh, Barrett's esophagus is to ablate the mucosa and allow squamous mucosa to regrow. Uh, this is usually done by means of uh, uh, <clears throat> radio frequency ablation, uh, thermal ablation sometimes as well. Uh, but so if this is our area of uh, Barrett's esophagus right here, uh, the way this uh, works is the probe is inserted um, into the area of interest, uh, then the probe is expanded, uh, and uh, the radio frequency is uh, delivered to uh, uh, essentially burn or cauterize the surface mucosa down to a measurable depth. Uh, in looking at follow-up from this uh, kind of procedure, um, the uh, histologic outcomes, uh, you can see that a fair number require uh, repeat uh, RFA sessions. Um, in terms of complete response, um, 
two, three years out, uh, pretty good numbers, 90 plus percent. Uh, and those with high grade dysplasia, uh, fairly similar numbers, uh, and likewise for low grade dysplasia. So uh, those, are, those are good numbers uh, and certainly reduces the number of uh, repeat uh, endoscopies and biopsies that need to be done. Uh, there are some consequences and uh, I won't go into those in detail. Um, uh, one of the more significant, however, is uh, so-called buried Barrett's. When the regrowing squamous epithelium grows over uh, a metaplastic gland that has uh, under, begun to go undergo dysplasia and, and the potential for occult development of uh, non-visible carcinoma uh, is uh, therefore left behind. Uh, that's rare, but uh, not uh, zero. So as we look at adenocarcinomas of the esophagus, which of course is uh, what we're are concerned about, uh, these tend to be somewhat heterogeneous. Uh, they resemble gastric adenocarcinomas in the sense of classification. Uh, and uh, molecularly wise, they're similar to those as well. We have P53 mutations. HER2 mutation is fairly uh, common and uh, uh, can be used in, in treatment. Similarly, cyclin D1, cyclin E genes, uh, retinoblastoma gene, P16 genes may be mutated uh, in these patients. Well, um, so uh, diffuse type lesions can be seen in these cases. Uh, those are of concern. Um, and the other types of histologic uh, parameters can be seen with these as well. So let's go on to our next slide. Um, as we think about things that uh, predict uh, metastasis, depth of penetration is the most important one here. Um, so with the T1A, meaning confined above the muscularis mucosa, uh, above the submucosa, uh, very low rates. Uh, T1B, it begins to become important. Um, and so uh, these tumors that are smaller or lar versus larger, uh, don't have invasion uh, or are depressed, those tend to be the ones that you're worried about uh, in these situations. And because of this data, uh, many endoscopists feel like they can successfully treat the T1A lesions with uh, mucosal resection or other surface ablative techniques. As we report these, it's important to bear in mind the uh, uh, staging uh, parameters and the uh, CAP protocols are uh, very useful for this. Uh, certainly you're gonna report the type of procedure, relationship to the esophageal gastric junction, size, type of lesion, grade, and so forth, and the depth of invasion, the T-stage, uh, margin status, and of course any prior treatment effect. Um, which can be uh, pronounced uh, in some of the neoadjuvant treated uh, patients, uh, evidence of LVI, perineural invasion, and uh, lymph node status. Uh, nice graphic here from the protocol to help define uh, the differences that we're concerned about. Um, as we see, T1A is intramucosal. Um, it has not be gone be beyond the uh, um, muscularis mucosa, which is defined here. Uh, here, T1B goes just into the submucosa beneath the muscularis mucosa and therefore has uh, access to uh, higher caliber lymphatics. T2 is into the wall, T3 is beyond the wall, T4 into adjacent structures, um, and so forth. Um, needless to say, uh, stage groupings uh, correspond to, similarly to uh, both the size of tumor and the presence of nodal versus distant metastasis um, as we're familiar with in other organ systems. So of note in the uh, esophageal staging system, um, T0 is any patient who has uh, dysplasia. Um, and those patients will get frequent screening follow-up and potentially uh, ablation. Uh, the T1A lesions can be uh, resec often can be resected uh, uh, endoscopically or ablated, uh, whereas T1B in stages two and three will get adjuvant neoadjuvant chemotherapy uh, with uh, subsequent resection, and uh, the, the stage fours uh, those will get uh, concurrent chemoradiation uh, in efforts to uh, control local disease uh, 
and, and prevent some of the complications associated with obstruction or, or perforation. Okay, so here's a quick review. Uh, looking at this, what do we think? Is this benign or malignant? Uh, we've got some ulcer and inflammatory debris here. We've got some enlarged nuclei. Uh, we've got some eosinophilia inside the nuclear uh, cavities or nuclear spaces. Um, if you guessed herpes, you were right. Okay, how about this one? Is this benign or malignant? Uh, well, we've got mitoses, we've got some atypia here. Um, I'm granted this is one high power field, but uh, the answer here, this is ulceration change. Uh, here's another. Okay, we've got columnar mucosa. We have a partly squamous epithelium lined duct. Uh, would we call this Barrett's esophagus? Uh, here we've got nice gastric type mucosa. Here we've got something else. Well, so uh, this trick question, of course, depends a bit on whether you're uh, in Great Britain and its uh, sphere of influence or the United States. Uh, we don't see intestinal metaplasia here. And so although this squamous epithelium lined duct does define uh, the uh, esophagus, uh, and so therefore this is metaplastic epithelium overlying, um, we would not call this Barrett's esophagus, or it's certainly not uh, Barrett's esophagus in the sense of having an increased risk of neoplasia. Now, what's this down here? Well, uh, you could think this might be PANF cell metaplasia, or uh, it may also be pancreatic metaplasia uh, or pancreatic heterotopia. And sure enough, esophageal duct, gastric fundic mucosa, uh, pancreatic metaplasia. I guess I got it right. All right, here's another one. Is this benign or malignant? Dysplastic or non-dysplastic? Well, we have some nuclear variability, some perinuclear clearing here in a couple of cells. Got some variable size, so certainly some irregular shapes uh, to some of these nuclei. Here's a mitotic figure, maybe even a slightly atypical mitotic figure. Um, we've got some perikeratotic change on the surface. Uh, and so based on that, we might say, oh, this probably is intraepithelial neoplasia. Okay, well, let's uh, just uh, wrap things up with a few odds and ends, some mesenchymal lesions, melanoma, and so forth. Uh, um, lyomyoma is a common uh, lesion in the esophagus, probably the most common uh, stromal neoplasm that we would encounter. Uh, these are almost uniformly benign uh, and have the characteristic eosinophilic cytoplasm, spindle-shaped cells, um, and uh, may occur both in the muscularis propria as well as in the uh, uh, muscularis mucosa. Uh, another tumor that is occasionally encountered in the esophagus is a granular cell tumor. Uh, this usually is arising in the lamina propria. And uh, it can masquerade as a variety of other things, including various uh, storage diseases, uh, foamy histiocytes, and so forth. So having a, a degree of uh, uh, awareness uh, of that uh, is important, uh, but certainly seeing the characteristic cytologic features, uh, granular cytoplasm, and having the uh, characteristic immunohistochemical profile would uh, save you from a misdiagnosis. Uh, other mesenchymal lesions, schwannomas, inflammatory polyps, giant fibrovascular polyps, nodulary capillary hemangiomas, melanosis, all of these can be seen uh, fairly uncommon um, and uh, probably will drive you to the uh, textbooks uh, rather than to my video when you see them. Melanoma is one you should be able to recognize. Uh, other mucosal surfaces, it can appear uh, much the same as it would in the oral cavity, vagina, anal, anal areas, uh, various uh, variable morphology. Remember that it can mimic things. So uh, a very high grade, uh, potentially squamoid type lesion, uh, keep melanoma in the back of your mind as a possibility. Um, other things that occasionally come to the surgical bench would be achalasias. Um, such as uh, you see here with a distal uh, stricture or ring and a very patchless type of uh, 
dilated esophagus uh, secondary to that uh, obstructive uh, uh, disease. Occasionally, patients will, uh, with the Mallory Weiss tear, will uh, come to resection as an emergency, uh, but that's uh, again uncommon, more commonly seen at autopsy. Well, if you have any questions, I certainly hope that you'll uh, reach out and contact me. Uh, I hope this has been helpful in terms of evaluation of esophageal diseases. Thanks so much for being with us. If you like this, uh, please uh, share it with your friends um, and uh, post your comments below. Uh, like it, that uh, also helps our ratings. Uh, we're happy to do this and uh, do it uh, with a genuine interest and desire to help uh, uh, pathologists around the world to become better educated in the diagnosis and management of these uh, sometimes complex and complicating uh, diseases of the gastrointestinal tract and elsewhere in the body. So until next time, uh, thanks so much for joining me and uh, we'll hope to see you again.